everybody. My name is uh, Ankit Agarwal, and I'm a senior product manager with HPE. Uh, today, I'm here to talk about InfoSight with you folks. Uh, my role and responsibilities are I basically look at the core platform of InfoSight and work on building those, these capabilities, while I collaborate with our line of business product managers to bring in new integrations and new use cases for our customers. Today, I have with me Sajid Thampi, uh, who is uh, our principal data scientist, to also talk about the goodness of AI that we are bringing with InfoSight. But before I start, just with a quick show of hands, just wanted to see within the audience how many folks are really aware about what InfoSight is, or for how many folks this is a new thing. So just who knows about in InfoSight? I'm aware of it. I've never been hands-on on it. Got it, got it. So looks like most of the folks are familiar about InfoSight. So I will not spend too much time going ab uh, about actually what InfoSight is. I will do a brief introduction and then jump on to some of the capabilities that we have added over the last, last 12 months or so with InfoSight and also focus on some of the use cases that we deliver to our customers to make their lives better, right? So with that, let's actually start uh, with the presentation. So first of all, just to set the context, right? what is the problem that we are, we are actually addressing with InfoSight? And the biggest problem that we are addressing today is actually we are uh, taking the complexity out of managing modern infrastructure. Uh, today, almost all businesses are, disruptive, are disrupted by technology. Every business in every sector is relying upon technology for competitive differentiation. You have an Amazon going into every sector and disrupting that business, and that business need to rely on technology to provide competitive advantage to their customers, right? So, so with that, what is happening is, today's IT is burdened to deliver competitive business differentiation to the end customers, which means the digital transformation is taking root across the industry, right? So what happens with that, IT wants to focus on innovation rather than on reactive troubleshooting. And, and reactive troubleshooting is also becoming very, very complex. So in this kind of a background, you really need a friend or an intelligence that can be with you and can actually help you in um, managing your infrastructure. And that is where the promise of AI comes in. And with that, we actually uh, enable InfoSight for our customers. So at a very high level, right, what is InfoSight? InfoSight is a solution that looks at all of your infrastructure and on top of that, in all of your workloads as well to provide the, as an end customer the visibility into how these applications and workload are running. And then the aim is to have a self-managing, self-healing, and self-optimizing infrastructure. In your, uh, in your data center, right? Uh, so this is autonomous and this is context aware. And we'll talk more about how InfoSight really functions uh, in the later part of this presentation. Now, we talk about this. There's another complexity which is, which is going on, right? Uh, the modern infrastructure is highly complex. And this is a research done by IDC, which basically talks about that more than 90% of problems actually arise over the storage tier. Right? So what does that mean? It means that you need to have a complete visibility into a complete stack to run the modern infrastructure. It's not just the storage, it's across the stack. And HP is uniquely actually positioned to provide you this kind of intelligence that can look at across the stack and help you manage and run it effectively. So with this, uh, a quick take on what InfoSight is and what are the use case that we go after, right? So InfoSight, again, looks at the complete stack, uh, looking at your physical hardware, which is your storage. Uh, we have extended InfoSight to your compute, to your server, and also have brought in InfoSight uh, uh, to actually our converged and hyper-converged offerings. Then going up, InfoSight is actually a cloud-based solution that provides a complete uh, overview, a, sing a single pane of glass for all of your inventory, all of your infrastructure uh, at, at one place, right? So it, is, uh, it provides you that global, uh, it, that single pane of glass. And then on top of that, it provides predictive uh, analytics. So what I mean by predictive analytics is because we can look at all the devices that are deployed across the install base, we can see what are the problems that can actually impact your environment. And predictively, we can 
actually work with the customers to resolve any of such situations actually arriving or arising on their, uh, in their environment. So leveraging the power of global learning, we can predictively prevent problems from happening. Then uh, we basically talk about AI-driven uh, operations. So when we talk about AI-driven operations, what we mean is, so not just prevent the problems, but also help our customers to get the best value out of their investment. And how we do that is by actually helping them to, first of all, to optimize their environment. So basically making sure that they are getting full uh, value out of their investment. And secondly, we basically uh, optimize the performance of, uh, of their environment as well. So with that, we provide the value to the customer back. The third thing we also do is, the other job of IT is often planning and sizing. So there we actually use the power of our models that we have built to forecast how a particular workload may perform if you deploy it in a, uh, on an infrastructure or a, or a device and help customers uh, make, that, uh, make, make that planning decisions. Also, we can forecast into the future and help actually them plan for future uh, quarters. So this way, uh, we talk about the value that InfoSight brings. Again, th take a moment, right? This is actually happening across the stack, not just at one particular uh, point pro uh, uh, one particular point product. This is happening at your storage tier, this is happening at your servers, this is happening also at your converged and hyper-converged solutions. So that provides great value to the customers. What, but when you uh, are going through these things, can you uh, talk about which things are done in the cloud versus which things are done locally on the machine? Because I think that's really an interesting aspect as well. Absolutely, absolutely will do. Uh, Later in the slides, we actually go through that, and we'll talk about some of the features that we have available on the cloud, some of the things we have available uh, uh, on the devices themselves. This is just a quick kind of a roadmap direction of how we are actually building this, this product, right? Uh, InfoSight, the, originally we started with storage. Uh, really, the roots of the solution lies with Nimble Storage, where when Nimble Storage was, was a small startup and looking to actually differentiate by providing a great customer experience. So we really started looking at how we can do that while actually maintaining our cost structure. So with that, we started looking at how we can automate the jobs that actually support perform and provide a differentiated customer experience. And now we are that expanding that across, across HPE. So the first thing that we do is we provide this uh, AI across the stack that we have uh, in terms of the infrastructure and then take it up the notch to, uh, to the virtualized uh, environment and also to the workload. Again, another thing to notice is at the very top, I have the, actually the personas that we are building this product for. At HPE, we not just serve one persona. We are not just talking with a storage admin or an infrastructure admin. We actually talk with multiple jobs and multiple personas within an IT environment. So a person like an app owner, a DevOps, a cloud administrator, all of these folks we are talking with, and then we are building this product to provide value to all of them. And how we are providing that value is by actually leveraging the power of AI, providing global monitoring, predictive analytics, support aut automation, and edge analytics. Edge analytics is an area where we are saying the, the AI should be where it makes most sense. So for some use cases, you want the AI to be in the cloud where you can get a global view of what is going on in your environment. But for some other use cases, you want it to be actually on the device itself so it can be as real time as possible and take action right away. So these we talk about is our edge analytics use case where we are bringing this to the device itself. Uh, then we say something as prescriptions. These prescriptions you can is a kind of an analogy from what uh, we, we see in the medical field, right? Uh, you have a set of uh, scenario that, that is going on, and a doctor writes your prescription to address that before actually you, your health gets impacted. Similar way, by leveraging the power of AI, we can look at an environment and then benchmark it against the similar workload running across the install base. And then based on the benchmark and from the best practices we learned from the global in install base, we can provide a prescription to a particular customer to optimize the performance of their infrastructure for that given workload within their environment. So these we call as prescriptions. So they are very, very highly accurate contextual recommendations that we provide and actionable recommendation to the customers. 
uh, and then proactive management. Uh, okay, so how we are doing this? First of all, we are extending H, uh, InfoSight across HPE, right? So we'll talk about, uh, originally it came from Nimble Storage, then last year we actually extended it to our three-part storage, and this year we have extended it further. And I'll, in the next slide we'll talk about how broadly we have extended InfoSight uh, already. And then we are actually also going up the stack. We are looking at your virtualized environment. We provide full stack visibility through your VM environments. And this we are also extending across. Right? We are adding more apps, more workloads that will provide insights on. Ultimately, your today's IT care about the workload. right? So InfoSight's focus is to provide the IT insights into, uh, insights into the uh, environment that impact the business. So that's where we are going up the stack all the way into the workloads. Then we continue to innovate on the AI side and build, uh, build new capabilities there. Uh, some of the, these things we'll talk about today, that what we have added over the last one year. And then you'll see this is just getting accelerated going forward. The other thing is also very important is when you are delivering to all these different persona in an enterprise environment, you need to have the SaaS maturity that only very few uh, services have today. You should be able to consume this service as an API. You want to be able to consume this service as, uh, as a portal. You want to be able to have a uh, hugely scalable kind of a platform. And this is where we are also bringing these capabilities with InfoSight going forward. Now, I talk about what we did in the past one year, right? So till last year, InfoSight supported Nimble Storage and 3 pi Storage. Just in last 12 months, we actually extended InfoSight to our new Primera Storage. We extended to our server line, our, all the rack servers with ProLiant, Synergy Compute, and also actually Apollos. We added, we announced the SimpliVity integration uh, a couple of months ago, and we also extended to another converge solution called Nimble Storage DSCI. So within the one year, we have made tremendous progress uh, with actually extending InfoSight. Now what I'm going to do is I'll briefly touch upon some of the use cases and the value that we deliver to customers. Feel free to ask any questions that you have around InfoSight. And I'll also have Sajit actually join me in terms of talk about how we leverage actually machine learning to deliver value to customers. So first of all, InfoSight originally started to really reduce the pain point of IT, right? Our motto really was that we wanted to make the life of IT professionals simpler while delivering uh, the value of IT to, the, to our customers, right? So how we did that was we really looked at, we make our mo motto was that if we see a problem once in the install base, we'll make sure that this problem we can prevent across the install base, right? And how we did that was, we, whenever we look at the problem, we open a ticket for that. Our uh, support proactively engage the customer. Our engineering figure out the root cause, and then work with our data scientists to build a model on how we can actually uh, detect same behavior uh, in, the, uh, in the install base. So the way InfoSight works, just to give a quick overview, is we have these sensors actually built in into our devices. And via these sensors, we receive telemetry data every second from, uh, from our devices. So to give you just an idea, we collect thousands of data points every second per device from hundreds of thousands of devices across the install base, which give us the power to recognize patterns, healthy or unhealthy infrastructure behavior patterns, and then really uh, flag any anomaly that we see as we receive this data. Once we flag this anomaly, our support proactively engages customers to prevent the disruption. So this is what we say, uh, predictive analytics, predictive support analytics. Um, how, how much data are you talking about? So that sounds like a lot of data. <clears throat> it's huge. It's like, uh, just to give you an idea, we did, a, we did run some numbers a couple of months ago, and we figured out so far we have collected 1.25 quadrillion data points. So that is 1,250 trillion data points that we have collected from our devices over the last eight years. So it's humongous amount of data that we have collected. And one thing that everybody, when you talk with, will say, 
once you have huge amount of data, and today's compute, the power of compute that you get uh, in today's uh, modern world environment, you can then really start to learn from this data. And that is what we are doing with InfoSight. So this is an example that uh, will give you some idea of how this system kind of works. This is a kind of a little bit older example, and, uh, and my, we might have shared it in the past, but this just gives you some flavor of how really the predictive analytics work, right? So this is what happened in a customer environment was there, uh, there was a latency impact and throughput impact within the environment, and there's a 10x disruption uh, in the throughput and latency. And the customer reactively reached out to us, and uh, we discussed there, and within, they were able to reach to us within a one phone call, and uh, we, was, we started to look into the problem. It basically arise because of the interoperability issues between the, the external storage the customer had in the environment and the way ESX was issuing iSCSI commands to that external block storage. And this was causing, uh, uh, basically this was causing huge memory leak and that was causing this problem in the throughput and latency. So our engineering was able to actually identify the issue proactively and then, uh, then fix this issue for the customers. Then we built a sophisticated rule-based model to basically prevent this happening from across the install base. And we were able to identify 600 systems susceptible to running into this problem, and then proactively we engage them and resolve this issue. So this happened a few years ago, and honest, to be honest, we use very sophisticated rule-based uh, uh, rule uh, methods, right? It was not really in the true sense machine learning back then. <clears throat> but from then to now, we have actually added a number of uh, these kind of signatures. Across the HP portfolio, and this is beyond Nimble storage, this is with Nimble, with 3 par, and with our servers, we have thousands of these complex fingerprints, right? And we are collecting uh, <coughs> historical data, we are collecting actually more than 5,000 data points uh, per array. And I think we are collecting thousands of data points from our servers as well. Now, as I said, it was very sophisticated rule-based in method methodology before, but we have extended to actually using supervised and unsupervised machine learning techniques today. The reason we are using unsupervised machine learning is because we have such an expense of data that we can proactively actually identify patterns before a customer reaching out to us and take proactive actions right away. Right? Uh, I'll actually invite Sajid to talk about how we are doing some of this. Hey guys, so hi, hi. Um, so I'm Sajid Thampi. Um, so I function as a data scientist in the HP InfoSight team. Um, so without much further ado, let's move on to the, the first thing. So what, what Ankit just talked about is what we call internally fingerprinting, and there are many ways to kind of call it signatures, fingerprinting, and all those kind of things. So we use unsupervised and supervised time series clustering algorithms to kind of figure out what, else, what exactly is going on here, right? So we have subject matter experts that when you have a problem in the field and when we see them report to us, we have subject matter experts look at the time series data. So just to give you a, a kind of like an example of what actually happens here, let's say, let's say we have time series of data from a certain sensor come in in, in, that, in that chart on the left. So don't, don't worry too much about what T minus one and T minus two means, they just mean they're, they're coming in in a certain day. It could be every day, it could be uh, every second or every minute, right? But the fact of the matter is you have a fingerprint of some sort that comes in, and we have what we call a fingerprint identification engine, which kind of looks at all the kind of fingerprints that we already have, and then it tries to make an informed guess right there. So it has a kind of a library that kind of it goes back and looks up on, and what it does here is when you see that staircase kind of thing come in, um, you don't know at that point whether it's, it's a staircase there or it's like that boxed pattern that you're gonna see. But you do know that you have, you've seen three of the, the boxed ones before and only one of the staircase ones, right? So when, when a simple pattern like that starts to form, you know, we are able to tell using prior knowledge and pre-baked intelligence from subject matter experts that this is most likely a, you know, a CPU under provisioned uh, scenario, fingerprint playing out here, rather than a, you know, a bandwidth kind of saturation issue. And then as we wait, um, we can have this, this pattern form itself and manifest itself and we become progressively more sure 
of what that pattern is. So that's just an, a, kind of like an example to show how this thing actually plays out, right? So again, the, these models, these fingerprints, obviously we can't be kind of doing this for every single fingerprint out there, right? So we have sophisticated methods that we use to generalize these patterns. We don't want to memorize them. Uh, memorizing, it's, it's easy. You know, you take a pattern, you put it in a database somewhere. The next time it happens, you look it up rather quickly and you're done, right? So that's not, that's not learning. That's just literally memorizing. But we want to generalize, which means we should be or we are capable of spotting patterns that look more or less similar, but we have never seen any of it before, right? Uh, I'll, I'll have another demonstrative example for that to kind of just follow that, that power, that capacity. And that is true machine learning because, uh, you know, in the proverbial example that you'll see in, out there is like cats and dogs. How does, you know, uh, you, you can't give it a picture, you can't give Google a picture of a cat and a dog of all the possible combinations. It somehow picks, up, it picks that up and is able to identify it with features. That's what we, that's what real machine learning is really about, right? So, um, and of course, that's what helps us to be proactive and not reactive, which means we can tell this thing is forming and we, just, we seek to generalize and not memorize these patterns. From a metrics perspective, um, we try to preserve high precision. Now, that's very different from, um, from what, say, a Google or a Facebook or a, an Amazon might want to do because uh, for us it matters what we tell the, the storage admin or the, the system administrator, whoever's looking at it. We don't want false positives. So we, we want very high precision in what we say. It's okay to even miss out a few alerts maybe, but then what we tell, we want to be 100% or very close to 100% as, as sure as possible. And uh, all, all of this, the, the technical term, uh, terminology, if you will, is like what we call Bayesian priors. All of that is baked in into our models, and we kind of preserve and keep that in our in a library of sorts, and our models learn that. And that's what makes helps InfoSight become kind of like application aware. So the, the kind of um, the kind of uh, problems that we are able to capture are things like CPU cache under provisioning, cache mis misconfiguration, bandwidth saturation, or any kind of limits that are tightly placed out there. Moving on to like AI driven operations, right? So um, the, the central idea here is, and I'm sure Ankit has touched on it in, in just the prior slides, is to take the guesswork out of um, all kinds of operations. So we want to improve performance. So an example recommendation that we could give to a storage admin would be to kind of apply QoS to volume one and improve the performance in volume two, right? Uh, we may have hosts that are over or undersubscribed when it comes to CPUs or how many CPUs we have provisioned on it, physical or we might have given them more vCPUs or less vCPUs, and that can cause all kinds of contention issues. We are able to capture that one too. Uh, the third could be very simple capacity limits kind of uh, scenarios. Now that again is very simple, if truth be told, because um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's mostly straight line fits that you can do, and that a lot of our competition also does that. Uh, not strictly machine learning, but we kind of put it on in, in, that, in that bucket too. So are you doing all three metrics, it's multiple metrics, multiple dimensions? Yeah, yeah, the same we, do, we, do, we like do that. Ready state and all that kind of stuff? Okay. Yes, we do that. So here's another example of um, something that we do even going beyond recommendations, right? So we don't want to be doing recommendations just because that's the buzzword in the industry. So we have something that we call the, uh, we call it, actually we call it many names. We have it, we call it the predictive impact score, the potential impact score. But the central idea is it's an impact score, uh, which lets the storage admin or whoever is looking at it decide by themselves whether something is a problem or not, right? So let's say we have this kind of scenario play out where you see latency, right? So this is latency that you have, ignore what the y-axis is, it could be anything. But your first, your eye would lead you to the first peak there and probably you might ignore the second peak there, right? Now this is what, this is where the, these kind of scores help. Because in the back end, we know that that peak there is expected, right? Your attention shouldn't be there, not on the, on the big one, but should be there on the small one, because the system figured out that that peak there isn't as high as, it shouldn't even be that high, right? This one is high, but it's expected. So we have scores that tell you that, you know, don't go chasing latency on, on a certain metric. Um, just don't go chasing that peak on that particular metric, instead, go where we, we are pointing you to because we know that peak is even more serious than the big one that might draw your attention. Yeah. 
So that's a, probably a low impact, and we are able to tell you that that's a high impact. So when you're looking for time zones where you want to go do analysis, go look in 14th March, whatever, instead of 7th Feb, whatever. So that's a big, big thing that we can kind of guide you towards. InfoSight can guide you towards. So we have a, a notion of what we call an AI performance recommendation engine. It's mostly, uh, it's also called a storage recommendation engine internally. Uh, what it does is it, it helps you analyze your, your storage on your, on your array, and it lets you choose time zones that might be of interest to you. So in this particular case, you know, you're, it's probably not visible here, uh, but there's a, you, you could see a, a dotted pillar there. So the user can zoom in in that area and say, look, I want to analyze what, what went on in that time zone, right? And it gives you, on the other pane, it gives you recommendations. It gives you multiple recommendations. It can tell you, you know, consider QoS limits. It can say, stagger your workloads and do something there. Or you could even upgrade to a higher tier controller uh, because that could be causing some kind of um, uh, read write, uh, random read performance issues that it is diagnosed, right? It also tells you volumes that are potentially impacted by this, and uh, that can be really powerful. So if you notice, we also have like these question mark things on the detail side. That's like a, a quick tutorial. If you hover over it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to tell you what that particular thing means. This yeah. is pretty cool, but how, how does that work for the entire ecosystem? All these different components and different products now are incorporating InfoSight. Are they communicating on the back end to get a more holistic picture, to make a holistic recommendation, to say, this is your true hotspot? Yeah. impacts everything else. This is the root cause analysis type of thing? Absolutely, absolutely. So um, I, can, I can let Ankit talk. Sure. So I think that that's a very good question. And uh, for us, it's kind of a journey towards that. Okay. Right? Uh, we have added some of this, as we will talk about, with a solution that we present with Nimble Storage DHCI, where we are now able to see cross-stack components, which is your storage as well as, as your servers, and then provide more insights across that. But that is something we are actually looking to bring to the whole portfolio. Uh, and so that's, that's one thing. The second thing is also we do have visibility into virtualized infrastructure, virtualized environment from VMware. And that actually helps us to pinpoint for those workloads whether the problem is in the network tier, storage tier, or the server tier. And that is uh, what we, are, we do today. Yeah, well, with the published APIs, you can see the rest state and you know, right? So Correct. You can see what's going on. Yeah. James? Is there a way to tune the recommendation engine to tell it what's most important to me? Because it seems to me like some of that could be you know, either workload specific or business requirement specific or something. You might say, hey, this looks most important it's kind of in the default configuration. Can I tell it actually something else is more important to me? So I can, I can quote on the algorithmic side of things, uh, and I'll let Ankit talk to the product side. Algorithmically, yes. So on the, technically, you could potentially say, I, hey, you know, I care more about my VMs, so I want my recommendations tailor-made in a certain way. I care more or probably not as much about false positives. I want to see as much false positives because I have the time in the world, or I'm, I can dive, I, you know, we can adjust that. So we can literally say, um, you know, for customer A, they care more about storage, customer B cares about VMs, and customer C cares about QoS limits or whatever, right? Or that kind of thing. Now, whether we want to steer it that way is... Yeah, no, no, that's a actually a good point, right? So this is kind of your playground, if you will, right? This is very customizable. We allow you to pick any time, uh, time uh, period that you would like to, to actually analyze the performance of your infrastructure. Right? At the same time, the other thing we do is because ultimately you are driving business outcomes, you can actually say for this particular array or this, for this particular piece of infrastructure, is this something business critical for me or not? So there are parameters around where you can actually feed into the engine that this is business critical uh, uh, workload for me. And the recommendation would be very different from actually the, uh, if you say this is a general purpose workload. So that kind of flexibility we pro provide with this engine, where you can, act as, a, as a user, can provide that input to the system. So does that help? Could I as many like your SQL workload? Maybe. Or like, could I tag a particular workload and say this one is especially important? Uh, right. I, I'm noticing 20 milliseconds more latency than I expect on this workload, but actually it's the increase of one millisecond on this other one that really worries me. Oh, absolutely. You know. 
Is there, so that so is, I can tag those to say this is the one that's really important. You can absolutely say. You can say this workload is highly sensitive or highly important for. Yeah. And algorithm. So we don't say latency because latency is just one, one parameter or one feature. Uh, it's much more complex than that. So if you say this is my business critical <laughs> workload, we run different set of algorithms and different parameters to actually provide you recommendations versus if you say this is a general purpose workload. So that, that is the way, that is one input that goes into, into actually fetching these recommendations here. So this morning, uh, I think you said like 85% or I don't know if that was a number you just were thrown out there as a general idea or if that's an actual number you have, but 85% of people um, want it just to be fixed and they never want to hear about it. And then there's this other 15%-ish that they, they want to turn all the knobs and all that kind of thing. I, it seems like it's this kind of thing that those people are concerned about because if I know that latency specifically is the concern for this workload and I want to tag that, um, there's a lot of people that will be nervous when you say, no, 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 we built this whole big thing that's way more complex than that and we're going to tell you. I right. think those 15% are like, no, I just want to tell it that latency is the really yeah. important factor. I think that's a very good point. And for that, we do tell what's the, what's the problem. As an input, the, because as an IT admin, you know much more about your environment than we could ever know about it. So we just let you provide that input to us. But this engine does provide that information that this happened because of the read latency or write latency or because of CPU or whatever. So the root cause analysis, it provides the diagnosis. And then it also, and the diagnosis could be also multiple depending on the condition. It could be, hey, this, so like right now you see first priority issue and I'm not sure how visible this is. There could be multiple issues that maybe actually this engine would identify automatically for you. And then it will tell what these issues are. Then it will provide recommendations on how you could resolve these issues. Even these recommendations are uh, ranked recommendations. So the first one would be much more effective than the second one. And then the further detail would be provided about your environment on how you can actually implement those recommendations. So, so that is the kind of thing, uh, like that, that is what this engine does today. Is it safe for me to assume that the, it's algorithmically taken into account that if I were to, say, apply the first recommendation because it's going to have the highest level impact, that's not going to negatively impact something else? That is absolutely that we have taken care of that. Like, okay. what would be the impact on the whole environment? That is how we rank these recommendations, actually. Uh, a first part, so again, if you apply, for example, quality of service limit on a high CPU volume, right, as this recommends, we, this is ranked highest because this will not negatively impact anything else. Sure. So that's the whole idea. One more thing on this. Um, as you're applying InfoSight to other parts of the HPE product portfolio, I imagine that this, uh, maybe it's a question for the product guy, this is probably where a lot of your work comes in, right? Because the uh, specifics of tuning a uh, nimble storage array are very different from the specifics mm -hmm. of tuning a Primera array, got, let alone the specifics of like a network switch or a server or whatever else, uh, SimpliVity. Um, there's got to be a ton of work there. I mean, is it really still InfoSight if it's a totally different system? So ultimate, that's a great point, Stephen. Like, but ultimately, it's all about the user and the administrator. They need the business benefit out of the system, irrespective of how in the back end we have implemented the algorithms. right? So for a lot of these systems, there is this a common set of use cases that ultimately we, we are delivering to them. So when we say we provide a storage performance recommendation, it could be for Primera, it could be for FreePAR, it could be for Nimble, but ultimately this is a storage recommendation. Now, the specifics would definitely be different. Like for example, you can tune cache on Nimble, but you may not be able to tune cache on, on a Primera system. So, so the, those differences would be taken care of 
as as we basically provide these uh, these kind of recommendations. And who makes those decisions? I mean, does those come from like the expertise of the HPE solutions engineers or the product mm -hmm. managers, or or who's who's the one to say, you know, boy, we should be worried when a Primera when the cash ratio goes below such and such. I mean, who's who's makes that call, yeah. or is it automatic, or is it some ML thing? So uh -huh. so on the. So the ML side feeds on like people or subject matter experts <clears throat> giving it the data, right? So that it's only as good as that data is, right? So we assume the existence of um, subject matter experts tagging some kind of information, some information, right? We don't need, uh, and then we can expand on it. The kind of thing kind of learns from it. Uh, but if, for example, if a certain configuration exists for a certain class of products and it doesn't exist for the other, the ML won't know it until it's, it's seeded with that data. And there are ways to automate the learning process. Also. Yeah. So you have a set data set and parameters, you define your sandbox. So if you go beyond that, you don't know until, you know, you could have an outlier <laughs> and then that outlier makes you have to be reactive to the outlier or, then, or you could change the definition of your sandbox. Mm -hmm. It could be yeah. more capabilities or whatever, right? Yeah. So yeah, exactly. So ML methods exist where you can say the quantum of data that I have is pretty limited. So be more generous and accommodative when you see an outlier because you know you, your your seed data is not that great. But what right? if we want to, what so, if a customer wants to run a more dense environment, a hotter environment versus otherwise the thresholds are different? Does that take into accommodation? Yeah, so then we'll need the, to kind of retrain the model if the environments change to some extent, but that's pretty quick. We'll, we'll quickly adapt to that kind okay. of environment. And I think something we were touching upon previously, right? Uh, even if we don't know, we can detect patterns. And this is what we call unsupervised learning. And these patterns, when we generalize over the install base, we can then work with subject matter experts to actually define the actions for even these patterns that we did not previously know about. Uh, so, so this is where the, the power of actually looking at vast amount of data helps us. Pattern recognition. Yeah. 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 Cool. Actually, we need okay. to let go a little faster. faster. Yeah. <laughs> so, we have, um, so we also have like the continuing like how this particular thing works. I think we've already touched on some of this in this Q&A session, that brief Q&A session we had. Uh, but then here's, here's an example of how this thing would work, right? So coming back to the boxed signals, you would have two anomalous looking spikes. So we have a team of experts internally that actually look at it. So we know we've figured out something, we see an anomalous pattern. We, it doesn't fit with the norm that we would see. So we would have a team of experts look at this, right? And then the, the HPE InfoSight kind of learns that. So it understands that it's not just about two spikes on a, on a box train of sorts. You know, if the, if the spikes are on either side of the bogey or if it's on, on one side or a little one above the other, very close to each other, it understands that this is a problem, right? And it starts to tag these things and applies a, or recommends the same recommendation as you would if the pattern were to change, right? So this is kind of like what we kind of discussed. And this is also how we generalize and not memorize these patterns. And we like uh, probably an easier task here is like capacity planning. So we have, let's say you have you know the capacity chart that you see there. It's a, it's a little easier to do this, um, and a lot of the competition does it, and they pass it off as machine learning. But this is again a simple straight line fit. You know you see a, a cliff there, and a, it's ramping up. It's a straight line fit to tell when it it will like uh, in this particular example it says it's going to run out of capacity on September 25th. So we can run these kind of basic things too that a lot of our competition does too. Okay. And then we have um, uh, the resource planner, as we call it. Um, it's it's a basically it's a new thing. Um, it's a, it's our way of doing what if analysis on on various storage arrays. So what it lets you do is, so let's say you're in a deployment, you have some arrays, and you have new workload that you want to put it on that deployment, or you want to increase an existing workload. This, this thing here, this tool will tell you whether your existing infrastructure can take it, or do you need to upgrade in that same family by giving you some recommendations in terms of what are your CPU needs or your capacity needs. If they are impacted, you know, what do you do next, right? So you can run the an analysis on this. It's on our lab section, and uh, it helps the admin do it. And the way it would work is same deal, right? So let's say we have a very simple 
uh, storage sc scenario where you have a certain amount of storage and your IOPS are, again, the, the, the box train kind of thing, is around 10K IOPS or something of that sort, right? So now it works out and it says, so you anticipate it to go up, right? It's going to go up maybe roughly four times or five times however you want to look at it. Uh, so your naturally your tendency would be to kind of get more of uh, storage in here and the, the resource planner will help you with that. But the, the reality is, you know, your it's not just as simple as one thing going up and then you multiply that. It's not just as simple as multiplying a, a certain fixed ratio. There are a lot of uh, correlations that could be in there and they could not even be positively correlated. They could be negatively correlated and they could be the variations again need not be linear. So there might be some exponential component there. For the main reason that, you know, you could be running any kind of application on your storage array. What we observe is it's not a straight, you know, a simple extrapolation. So that's where the, the, the models help you uh, to understand that. So what the resource planner has at its back end is it knows that when a certain amount of workload is put on a certain kind of array or a storage environment, it can emulate that with real world data that it has seen so far. And is able to tell, okay, if you put this much load on this HF60 array, this is how it's going to perform based on historical data. We also have a notion of a lab data, which is more cleaner, but we use real data so that we can completely capture that. And the recommendations that it gives out uh, might be different because uh, it might, just to give you that example here that we have, is in this particular case, your current profile would need a certain amount of cache, a certain amount of capacity, and a certain amount of CPU. Uh, but the projected profile, notice it requires about the same cache and capacity, but the CPU goes up, right, three times. So it might recommend, say, if you, you, you need something, you need to buy something that, that gives you that capacity so that you're completely on the right side of these, these bricks that you have here, so you're safely on that side. So it might, uh, at, at first blush, it might look like your capacity is the same or your cache is the same, so why bother? But we factor many things in, into this. And does it keep historical information for all of these recommendations? Um, we, today it does not. We do have a plan, though, to include that. So. <laughs> um, but then there's, of course, on-premise um, kind of uh, workload insights. We can do basic saturation forecasting, as you see here. And there's some performance optimization and um, workload distribution that we can do on an array that is also uh, possible with our kind of workload insights tool that we have. So oh, back to Ankit. So, so previous, just to your point, Stephen, before, this is uh, something we actually added to our on-premise solution and for Primera storage and 3 pi storage. So you can, for really for the customers that may have regulations that prohibit them to actually send data to the cloud, they can actually leverage the power of on-premise insight to really do this kind of analysis right there. And this is again something that is workload aware. So when you are going to deploy a particular workload, you can actually run and see which particular device or which array would be the best fit in terms of saturation for that particular workload within your environment. But for on-premise workload insights, you, you have to have comparison from outside. So you're letting ingress. That, absolutely. So no, no egress, but ingress is okay. So basically, the models are built in the cloud and deployed on-premise. And they get updated with every release. And is this? Um, ML, or is it just like an expert system, or just some rules? Uh, I mean, how is the decision being made? So these are, we have, as we were talking about the resource planner, we have built actually sophisticated models for all the different models of arrays we have. And they are trained with the real world data. So these but it, it are, is ML training. This is ML yes. training okay. yeah. based models. Yeah, sorry about that. I just was uh, wanting to make sure that, because sometimes you know people say, oh, it's AI, but it's really just a set of rules. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So that's what I was saying at the very beginning. Like back in the days, we used to have sophisticated rules that can talk about interop issues, right? Yeah. Uh, so, here, so here, these kind of models, they actually sample from known distributions. So we have, we're pretty deep there in that sense. OK. So uh, we are actually running far behind. <laughs> Oops. So we'll try to accelerate a little bit. Uh, we have a lot of material to cover. So this is uh, something we talk about quite often, is the ability to provide full stack analytics with, with InfoSight. This is really being able to help customers take a look into their virtualized environment and really figure out what is going on there. Uh, one of the use case that a lot of customers get benefit right away from is the ability 
to do something we call needle in the haystack kind of analysis. Some of our biggest customers, and uh, I can't uh, name, the, the, name the customer, but this customer is a huge customer. They had a huge VM data farm with thousands of VM running. And these VMs were causing huge CPU usage or on their uh, storage devices. And they were working really hard. They could not really figure out what's going on because there were thousands of VMs. Which VM was causing that problem? That was not clear to them. And it, actually, they were planning to purchase more storage for more than a million dollars worth. They enabled InfoSight. They, they saw this, what we call tree map. This tree map is actually bird's eye view of your whole en environment, of your complete VM farm. And what it does, it shows these blocks that are color coded with latency, and the size depends on the IOPS these VMs are actually causing. They were able to identify the VMs that were actually causing huge latency issues. Um, and they did this so you can go further and see what is going on, why the latency is high. Then you can do something we call contention analysis, where you can see all the other VMs that may be actually hogging resources within that environment. So by doing that kind of analysis, they were able to figure out uh, three VMs that were causing, that were actually hogging on all the resources, CPU, on that particular, uh, in that particular environment. They figured out that what was happening was some antivirus software would run once the user would log out from that VM. So that, and that antivirus software will actually hog on to the, uh, all, all the resources and not let, uh, basically it would have very high CPU usage on the device. So this kind of analysis they were able to do very quickly using, using this, uh, uh, this what we have. Now what we did last year was we said, okay, that was the first iteration. That was complete correlations across all of your environment. Let's take it to the next step. Let's bring in real AI into this environment. So we built something we call now VM recommendation or cross-stack recommendation engine. This cross-stack recommendation engine is by a single click of a button can actually analyze your complete environment and provide you a bird's eye view of what's going on along with the recommendations on which VMs uh, may be having problems in terms of latency issues. Uh, it could be other issues also. It may also can tell you whether a particular host is under-provisioned or over-provisioned or things like those. So a whole host of things you get to see right away by just by a click of button. Again, similar to the storage recommendation, here we actually provide you the list of all the issues and then the diagnostic information, the recommendations, and then how you can take those steps. Now, air conditioning issues, those are hosts that are overheating? Yeah. And Do you have you more have to have, talk about? Would you have to have HPE software hardware for that? So, um, so the way we would capture that is mostly like when you have a, a problem, but it seems to like if you see a correlation among temperatures going up across the servers, right? Okay. So when you see that massive correlation right there, that's an anomaly. The system detects it. It's not a something. So we, we immediately start working our reasoning engine, so to speak, and then it works our way back and root causes okay. it. Okay. And then similarly to the resource planning bit, we also introduce the VM analytics with our uh, on-premise analytics. So this is something we added very recently, where it gives you complete overview of your VM performance. And we also give you a topology view of how your actually VM is mapped to your VM DKs, data stores, host, so on and so forth to give a complete data path and which, which paths are highly used and which paths actually have more bandwidth. So are, are you uh, testing out uh, proactive HA yet with this? What is that? Proactive HA. Proactive VMware HA. VMware stack <coughs> and InfoSight, is it? I'm personally not aware of that. OK. Uh, I can take that back. Thank you. Get back to you on that. Um, we may be doing it. So. Uh, so this is basically, we, we talk about how we expanded across the portfolio. I'm going to sp spend a few, uh, like a few minutes just talking about what we have done over the last year, right? So this basically is just shows you how InfoSight <coughs> goes to uh, compute to our uh, solutions, which are DSCI and, and, uh, and the SimpliVity, to our storage, including uh, three-part Primera, Nimble storage, and then the full stack with VMware. Uh, this is, where, where, this is a, actually a, 
a screenshot of our integration for our service. Uh, what we are doing here is we are really leveraging the power of ILO, which we have built into our service. And we aggregate all the information and provide you the single pane of glass for all of the servers in your environment via InfoSight. The great thing is it also provides you all the wellness information about those <coughs> servers. So what are criticals, what are not uh, critical. And we have more than actually, if I'm not wrong, close to 1,000 actually different uh, analytics uh, uh, that we perform on, on, this data, on these data points. So things like, like security analytics we perform. We can actually pro create a notification when we see there, is, there was a lot of failed login attempts. Uh, so these kind of things we can do for our, for our service today. And this is, again, something new, which will continue to expand as, we, uh, as this matures. Uh, this we talked about a little bit before, but this is where we are extending InfoSight with our SimpliVity uh, uh, portfolio as well. Uh, here, basically, we are providing this whole global learning uh, for, uh, for uh, our um, hyperconverged offering. Uh, we are using predictive analytics. We will be able to actually forecast into the future how the capacity is being actually uh, used and when the capacity will be full. Uh, we, with the, we leverage the power of uh, VM analytics or full stack analytics and have the same uh, things like, for example, noisy neighbor and uh, VM storage utilization, this kind of analytics are available for SimpliVity as well. I'll not spend a lot of time right now because I think Tim is going to go over in much detail in the following session. So does this have feature parity with Nimble? So that's actually a great question. The way we integrate with different products is we look at what, are, what is the MVP for that particular product. Where is the, what is the most pressing need of our customer today? Uh, and those are the features uh, those are the use cases we go after with that first integration. And again, we, we talk about that, for, for example, for SimpliVity, we, we look at the need to do predictive analytics in terms of the capacity uh, forecasting. And we look at the need to actually help customers in terms of wellness. And those are the two use cases we prioritize for SimpliVity integration with the first release. And those are the v one we are adding right away. Going forward, we'll add more as, as we move forward with this. Uh, this is, uh, I talk about the DSCI offering, which is our disaggregated hyperconverged offer. Uh, this is, uh, I think, we talk about previously as well, this really focus on providing value to customers uh, where they have, un or it's hard, hard to predict what kind of workloads, mission critical workloads that they have to deploy. And they can basically, uh, again, leverage InfoSight in terms of the same similar kind of analytics. This is also a very good example of InfoSight basically leveraging the power from multiple cross-stack devices. So because InfoSight is enabled for nimble storage as well as for our server portfolio, we bring that together and provide you the wellness information for the complete stack right from InfoSight for that. So that is a, this is a one example where we are, we are using that. Uh, so this is mostly I wanted to cover. I also wanted to go through a demo. I think we probably are running short on time for that. Yeah, we're running short I'll on time. I'll take some so, questions. Yes. Uh, is the, if the demo is recorded, we can actually, you can just give me a video and I can put it on the website later and uh, we'll just pretend that you had time. <laughs> okay, sure. If that's okay? Yeah, we can. Because I, I, think, I think we would much rather get our questions answered than anything. So, any more questions for them? About so, InfoSight for servers, mm -hmm. can you deploy that without having any kind of HPE storage? Like if you just had ProLiant servers? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. It cuts across everything, including synergy, um, SimpliVity, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a great question. Um, today, we have integrations with our ProLiant line, uh, Apollos, and Synergy for only compute. We don't have for Synergy Blades integration into InfoSight today. So that is something for the futures. So up on one of the slides, you had something about application analysis, like for SQL Server. How deep does that go? Like if I had too many connections open or I had indexing problems, could that be detected? So the way we look at the application side, right? Today, just by the virtue of having a storage device deployed, we know what kind of application is running on top of it. 
That could be just because of the user have tagged that application, or we have something called for nimble storage application policies, by which we know what can what application is running. For Primera and 3PAR, we have we are using tags extensively. So with that, we look at the interaction with the storage, and then we can provide whether, for example, a volume that is connected to like a SQL is seeing high latencies. However, it is not fully into that uh, SQL tier today. And that is where we also want to go. Okay. How far back uh, does the support for the server monitoring go? Do, like G10s only or like G8 or G9? G8, G8, G9, G10. Generation 8, 9, 10. Okay. I, I, anything with ILO 4 and ILO 7. ILO, yeah. Okay. That, that, that's, ILO a reasonable, that's a reasonable cutoff. Yeah. 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 Cool. 